New Year. I'm hoping, uh, Tabor, you guys are excited. Happy New Year to you guys. I hope you're excited about the year that's coming up. Happy New Year, Claire's home. Happy New Year, Okotoks. Come on, are you guys excited about what God is going to do in the coming year? Happy New Year, Lloyd Minster. Happy New Year, Lethbridge. You, happy New Year to all of you joining us online. It's, 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 it's funny, not, not really, but four or five years ago, I would say Happy New Year, and all of us were excited, weren't we? Excited for the new year, new possibilities. And then 2020 came along, and now we're like, all of a sudden, our excitement for the new years are like, yay. Let's see what this year brings. <laughs> Come on. Anybody else feel a little bit hesitant sometimes? Like, like going, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Let's let's be realistic. Okay, just for just for fun, just for how many of you have set New Year's resolutions? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, four, six, seven. Okay, where about the rest of you? <laughs> Come on, the rest of us are probably like, hey, um, been there, done that, bought the T-shirt, not doing that again. Okay, so how many of you that set New Year's resolutions already broke them? Oh, there, there, there we go. <laughs> it takes us about, we're seven days in. It takes us about that long to get going. No, it's all, it's all good. I, I, um, I feel like this, coming into this year, I feel something different. And not different excitement, wise or anticipation wise or even caution wise i feel coming into this year and i want to know if i'm the only one i feel hungrier spiritually hungrier than ever before i i sense i sense i was like when we just a lot of the songs that we just sang were prayers right <laughs> God, we need your courage. We need your wisdom. We need your vision. We need, I, we need more of you. We need all of you. So I don't, I don't know what the year is going to bring, and I'm not going to promise all these things and cast vision and all of that. But I just want, I want to point out in, in maybe something. Anybody else can just boldly say that's a way to describe it. That like I feel hungrier spiritually for, for God than maybe before and we don't know how to fill that hunger all the time but there's something in us and saying that's why we're here we're coming here and saying god this year more more of you amen now um a lot of you know 2023 uh and i took a sabbatical that we took five months and and um, rested and did a number of things in that time. It was very fruitful. But I knew at the end of the sabbatical, I knew coming back um, that the staff and, and the board and the team and all of you, men, you know, many of you, were going to be going, okay, what's he coming back with? What's God showing him? Because I, I do think weeks um, where I go away, you know, I do a quarterly where I go away and pray and read and all the rest of it. And I come back from those stock, you know, stoked with vision. Hey team, let's go. We're going to do this. And so the team is thinking he does that in one week, five months. Whoa. So I, <laughs> they were, they were braced and ready, but that wasn't the purpose of the sabbatical. But I knew as it was coming to an end, I was like, I gotta, I gotta sit. I, was, I just prayed and said, God, for me personally, for our church, what are you saying? What do you want, you know, in the next season of, of, of ministry for Joylyn and I, in the next season of ministry for the church, what is it that you want done? What do you, what do you want us to focus on? And I started writing some of those things out, and I wrote down five things that I really felt, like I personally, myself personally, but also we as a church needed to begin focusing on. One of the first meetings that I had was with the board, and we sat down, and, and they asked questions and, about the sabbatical, and I presented to them, actually presented in, in, in writing, and said, 
here are five things that I really felt, I really feel that I'm supposed to focus on, that, that we as a church are supposed to focus on. I went right after that, I went on a, a, a two-day, three-day retreat with our executive pastor, Pastor Jeff, and I, I, I went with him, and I shared with him again, you know, here's the five things that I really feel like we're gonna, we need to focus on. Shared with the staff, here's, here's the five things I really feel like we need to focus on. And, and I was, you know, solid and encouraged in that. And then, as I was preparing, if you remember, I didn't preach in the month of September. I actually traveled around all the churches and met, met everybody and just re, kind of reconnected relationally first before we got back into the pulpit. But I started preparing in September, right after that, for the series that we preached in October. And as I was preparing it, that series, you know, a series about the church and, and vision, all the rest of it, I was like, okay, God, what is it that you want to say and uh, and I knew that I really wanted to focus in on ecclesia and, and that whole thing and, and you know that idea. And I'm sitting I'm sitting there praying at, at my desk at home, and I look over and I had a stack of books that I was reading through throughout my sabbatical, and a lot of those books were were you know personal books, closer to God books, how to rest, what Sabbath is, all that kind of stuff. I intentionally stayed away from leadership books church <laughs> um, management books, all this kind of stuff, because that would get my brain going in the wrong direction. Um, so I stayed away from those in my sabbatical. So I had a stack of three of those books that I hadn't gotten to. And at the top of those three books that I hadn't gotten to was a book called Ecclesia by Ed Savoso. And I was like, oh, that's kind of curious. That's what I'm preaching. I wonder what he said. So I grabbed the book. And I still remember, like it was yesterday, I grabbed the book and I start reading. I get to the second chapter of the book, and he says, here are five things that the early church focused on that brought transformation to to the region around them and transformation. And here's five things that churches around the world begin focusing on brings transformation to cities. And, and, and I was like, whoa. And the five things worded a little bit different were exactly the same five that I felt God say to me, which, which I started crying, to be honest. I started crying right there because number one, I was like, my hearer works. Thank you, Jesus. Like, I was like, I heard right. I was like, okay. I started crying secondly because I was like, I, God knows me so well. It's one of those coincidences. God knows me so well that if I had read those five things first and then came back with the five, that had been Ed Silvosa's idea. And I wouldn't have been, ran passionately with it uh, in the same way. But when I read them afterwards, I was like, that's confirmation of what God already showed me. I was like, this is, this is not Ed's idea. This is God's idea. And I was like, okay. So you want to know what the five are? That's what this series is all about. And the five are, we're going to call it New Year's resolution. The five are focuses, five focuses, five things, you know, directional statements that we dressed up as simply as we possibly could so that we can remember it. But five directional statements that, that I'm looking at this and saying, okay, I've given up. I make fun of New Year's resolutions all the time, and I've given up, uh, given up on New Year's resolutions uh, myself. I, yet, you can't help it at the beginning of a new year to go, I need to be better at anybody else. But this year, this year, I was like, here's my New Year's resolution. Here's things that I need to work on, that I need to focus on, not just for this year, but for the coming years. And honestly, the remaining years that I have on the planet, whatever it might be, I was like, this is where, this is what it looks like when the church comes alive. This is, this is what it looks like. Because I'm grossly dissatisfied with the state of the church. Not, not our church. The big C church. And here's why is because when I read in the book of Acts the transformation that happened in entire regions from a handful of uneducated people 
and I look at the state of that church compared to the state of today's church, I look at that and there's a huge disparity and I'm going, I want what Acts had. I want that. I don't think, I'm grossly, I came here with a vision and, and a heart to grow a large church and believing that a large church was going to transform uh, the city of Lethbridge. And we've grown large, right? We've exponentially larger than, than we were 12 years ago. And yet, the state of our city here in Lethbridge, the state of our city in Okotoks, the state of our city in Tabor, the state, the state of the city hasn't gotten better, in fact, here in Lethbridge, I would say there's been a sharp decline in what's going on. And I'm, I'm grossly dissatisfied and hungrier than ever for a move of God than I've ever been in my, my life. I'm hungrier, I'm hungrier for transformation from God. I'm hungrier to see, I'm hungrier to see God, you connect with God on a, on a personal, deeper level, like exponentially, I can't shake it, this, something happened level. And you should be too. I'm hungry to see things happen in your family that you've been praying for for years. I'm hungry to see things happening in your business and in, in your community and in your neighborhood. I'm hungry to see a move of God that is going to leave a mark on whatever territory we are in. Amen? And I believe that these five are directional statements of how we get there. And the first one, I'm only going to give you one today, so you have to come back. <laughs> Just kidding. I will give you one. The first one today, the first one today is focus higher. Focus higher. I have to admit that I have often struggled in my personal prayer life. In fact, in my personal prayer life, I've gotten to the point, and I know I'm not the only one because I started talking with a number of you about your prayer life and different things. But in my prayer life, I honestly have got to the place where I'm like, what's the point? Anybody ever had that thought? Like, God knows what I need. What's the point? God knows my heart. What's the, what's the point? And I've, I've struggled with, with finding the point and, and going, okay. And going, okay, God, anybody else want to be brave enough to admit in your prayer life? You'd be like, well, I, you just don't have the same passion or luster or... Uh, uh, determination or connection, having a more difficult time connecting maybe than before. How about in worship? How about in personal devotion time? And this is not a, definitely, this is not a, a guilt trip, I promise you that. This is me saying, God, there's something inside of me. It's not, it's not that I feel dry. I just feel like something's missing. Like not missing from him, but something's, something's not clicking in the same way. And I know, come on, I grew up in church. I'm, I'm preaching this stuff. I'm pastoring stuff. I know all the go-to Christianese things to say and do and I know all that stuff. But even all of that stuff, anybody else, like, you know, the go-to when people are like, have you prayed about it? You're like, you think? <laughs> you don't think I've prayed about it? And you're just like, oh, of course I've prayed about it. Is it working? <laughs> Why is it not working? Nobody else has had these thoughts? Okay, this is just, this is Kelly's explosion. Look, it's okay. It's all good. But I, I felt convicted going to this year. I'm hungrier than ever. That, and I want to push in, not for, not for the Christianese standard, focus higher, God first, prayer, the, the standard, put God first, all that kind of stuff. I'm, I want to press in for a real 
authentic connection. And I felt convicted about having other things take priority in, in my life ahead of God. And my New Year's resolution is to focus higher, to shift my priorities to go, okay, my first, my first response to anything is that. Anybody else? Now, Let's unpack this a little bit. And we're gonna, I'm not just going to give you these five things in five weeks and then we're going to go on our nice merry way. I believe that these five things are going to be things that we're going to press into and focus on and teach on. And this is going to be themes for what we're going to preach. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna wrestle some of these things to the ground until we get it. And then we'll wrestle them harder. The, the dictionary says this about worship. It says, worship is a feeling of profound love and admiration. I don't like that definition. And the reason why I don't like that definition is because I hate the word feeling. Because feelings are fleeting. And I've often felt, there, there's a feeling already right there, like worship, prayer, devotions were more like a duty than a relationship based on a profound love and admiration. Anybody else? Right? And so when it says a feeling, so here's, here's the thing. This is what I've noticed. I was like, okay, when I, when I feel fear or I feel pressure or I feel uh, 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 scared of a diagnosis or I feel, I feel like something come against me strong, that feeling presses me deeper into prayer and into worship. Anybody else? Like, there's nobody like that your prayer life doesn't get better when all of a sudden you're pressured and all the rest of it. But what happens when those feelings of whatever it might be go away or that feeling of desperation? What happens when, when that just, just goes away? Does the same, same passion, love, admiration happen at the same time? For me, it's like, no, man, when I'm, my back's against the wall, I'm praying like crazy. My prayer life is on fire. But when things are going good, and, and what I don't like about this definition is like, okay, it's a feeling that I can worship when I get stirred by a certain song, like nobody's business. But what about when I don't like the song? Right? What happens if my feelings aren't stirred? Do I have to stir up my feelings in order to worship? And I feel like something's missing there, that we rely on that, that we sometimes stir up emotions or, or these kind of things in order to get to the place where we can, can worship. And I was like, that's, something's, something's not right there. But now, watch, let me break this down for you a little bit further. It's, you know, the dictionary says feelings of profound love and admiration. Here's a statement that I want you to think on. This is kind of, I'm wrestling this one to the ground, is that you worship what you love, Okay? And how many know that love is not just a feeling? 1 Corinthians 13 talks about that. You worship what you love, and what you love you will sacrifice for. Think about that, right? You worship what you love, and what you love you will sacrifice for. So worship is about love. It is. It's about admiration. Love is not just a feeling. It's about admiration. It's about love. And love is about sacrifice. Right? Love is it. What you love, you will sacrifice for. I love Tillamook ice cream. Everybody knows that. I love it. I will sacrifice a four-hour trip to Montana to get me some Tillamook. <laughs> Come on. Right? I mean, there... I mean, think about it. If you love your job, you will sacrifice it for it. If the moment that you stop loving your job, you stop sacrificing for it. If you love your family, you will sacrifice for it. If you love your spouse, you will sacrifice for them. If the feeling, come on, if the feeling of love goes away from that, then our sacrifice is the first thing that suffers. Right? 
So in the same way, worship, you will worship what you love and what you love you will sacrifice for. So therefore, one way to detect what you worship is to identify what you sacrifice for. Okay, one way to detect what you worship is to identify what you sacrifice for. So here's where I want, I've been doing an inventory for myself. And here's where I want you to do an inventory. And saying, if we want to press in deeper to our relationship with God, let's, we need to do an inventory. And one way to do an inventory is saying, where is my priority list as far as sacrifice? You can tell, you can say what your priorities are. You can say family first. Okay? You can say um, God first. You can say all the right things, but in reality, our inventory of what we sacrifice for or what we put priorities in our sacrifices for is going to determine what we're ultimately worshiping. Does that make sense? Okay, so I have det- I've, I've looked, and you know, it's not a bad thing to sacrifice for my family. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing to sacrifice for my job. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing to sacrifice for, for, I mean, you name it, for your health. It's not a bad thing to sacrifice for these things. Those are all good things. It, it, it's not necessarily that there's bad. And what we do sometimes is, Christians, we make black and white, good and bad, and we create these separations. But the re- reality is it's not always good and bad. It's about what we're putting first. And God says the first commandment that he gave in, in, uh, to Moses of the Ten Commandments, God says this, is you shall have no other gods before me. You will not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of which heaven above or an earth beneath or the water under the earth. We've, we've heard this. If you know the Ten Commandments, you've heard this. We should not make any idols. I always exclude myself when I was going, I don't have any images in my house that I bow down and worship. Check, I got that one good. But that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about images that you create, on, that you got idols and you, you bow down and worship them instead of God. He's saying that anything in which you sacrifice more for than, for, than, than you sacrifice for God is going to become a replacement of when I when I when I understood that I was like ooh oh and then I read this quote from St Augustine and St Augustine says the essence of sin is disordered love the essence of sin is disordered love that sin is not just the bad things. Sin is not just doing something bad, something... We in the church, we've created categories of sin, haven't we? Yeah. Right? Things that are bad, bad. But we also have... I'm putting myself on top of here and going, you know, I'm, I'm a good person. I don't, I don't do those bad things. But at the same time, I've been doing a self-evaluation going, wait a second, there's some disordered... Love, because love, I will sacrifice for what I love. What I love, I'll sacrifice for. Worship is an essence of love. I'm looking at this and going, there's some things that I've got out of order, disorder, that I'm sacrificing for myself or for others or for for different whatever it might be. And not all those things are bad. A lot of those things are really good. They're just not meant to be first. So my... New Year's resolution then is to identify my priorities by evaluating what I sacrifice for and setting them back into the proper order. The writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 13. It says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice, there's that word, of praise. Let's continually, not, not just once, not just once a week, continually, not just when I feel like it, continually offer to God a sacrifice. It's got to cost me something. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, but in the story, you know, during Christmas time, about how David 
how David refused to give an offering to God or to worship God for something that wouldn't cost him something. First, 2 Samuel 24, if you want to look it up. He refused to give to God something that didn't, he didn't have to sacrifice for, that didn't cost him something. He refused to do it. Why? Because he understood that, that what I love, I will sacrifice for, and I want to make it clear that I'm going to sacrifice and I'm going to do this, and that he understood that continually I'm going to offer God a sacrifice of praise, that it has to cost me something. Then he, the writer of Hebrews goes on and says this, and do not forget to do good and to share with others for such, with such sacrifices, there's that word again, God is pleased. Okay, so he says, first, sacrifice, continually sacrifice, and, and, you know, praises to God. And then he says, second, and don't forget to do good and to share with others. In other words, here's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Here's the priority list of our, our sacrifices is God first, others second, Right? And then he says this. This is, this is kind of what jumped out at me. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. God is pleased. God is pleased. And it hit me, God is a person. And every person has personal preferences. You have personal preferences. I have personal preferences. And here's what I recognize in my own life is that most, a lot of my relationship with God has been based on my personal preferences, not his. That worship can't be just a feeling because that's based on my preferences, not on his. That worship can't just be when I feel like it because that's not a sacrifice. Right? Because that's burst on my... If, if you got into a relationship, and in that relationship, the entire relationship was about your personal preferences rather than the others, that relationship's not going to last. Promise you. Because we're not created that way. We, it can't be just about that. God is a person, and God has personal preferences. And, and, and focusing higher is saying, hey, God, what do you like? What do you prefer? But I, yeah, I don't feel like that. You know one of the things God likes? God likes hands for some reason. It says this in the Psalms, says it again in Hebrews. God likes hands, and it says that part of the sacrifice, the psalmist says it, is lifting your hands is a, is a form of sacrifice. God's got something for hands. So when you see some of us lifting our hands to God, does it, are we doing that because we feel like it? No, it's kind of weird. <laughs> like, it's like, I'm lifting my hands. Are we saying, I surrender? Yeah. I got a question. Like, what, what are we, we lift the hands, like, like what, we, what, what's, are we doing it because it's our preference? No. Are we doing it because it's our comfort? No. We're doing it because God prefers sacrifice praise. God has preferences. And one of the things is continually giving sacrifices of praise. And God also has preferences. This is what pleases him, is that it pleases him that he's first, and it pleases him that others are second. And it also says what displeases him. Romans 8.8 8 says, And those who are in the flesh, that's Bible speak, for who are selfish cannot please God. Those who put their preferences first cannot please God. And I'm not just saying doing all the bad things is all about me and all the rest of it. No, no, no. I'm saying there's some good things that I have put in place of that things that I should be taking care of myself and taking care of my health and taking care of, of this and all the rest of it, those are all good things. They're just not meant to be first things. Does that make sense? So here's, here's my challenge for you. And 
in this, in our new year, and in this week, is I want you to evaluate what you sacrifice for. And to be honest with yourself, not, not with anybody else, you don't have to confess it to anybody else, but just be honest with yourself and saying, what are you willing, what do you sacrifice for? And make a list, maybe, you know, private time this week, you know, make a list of, journal it, just write down, I sacrifice for this, all right? You know, things that I didn't prefer, feel, I sacrificed for, and I did these kind of things. What did I sacrifice for? And then, and then watch, if you, in that list, how many times God's name comes up. If you're like me, that's a very convicting thing. Because I'm like, oh. And I'm a pastor. I preach Jesus. I love Jesus. I worship Jesus. I do prayer, private time prayer. I do devotions. I do all the things out of duty. But I was like, when I started doing the sacrifice evaluation, I was like, oh. God, I need to reevaluate. I need to reorder. Focus higher promise of God is this, in James 4, it's this, come near to God, and he will come near to you. In other words, it, it's, he doesn't say do this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. He just says, take a step toward. That's why it's focused higher. Just, I'm just going to choose to take a step towards him. And it's not all the way. I don't have to trash everything that I'm doing. I'm just going to take a step toward this year. I'm going to take a step towards God and know that his response is he's going to draw near to me. Amen. Today's takeaway is simply this. Is you worship what you love and what you love you will sacrifice for. In church, with your pastor, there's going to be some changes in how we do church for this one reason. And we've done and been proud of the fact that we are we're a church that reaches the lost, and I, I love that. And we do attractional church, and we attract and create a safe environment for people to invite people to, you know, to come and, and visit and invite, and all that. That's that's good. But in the midst of all of that, part of that is, I think, is disordered love a little bit. We're saying, hey, we, we need to make some changes so that we can take a step towards God, and we can get so good at doing church that we just do it without Him. And I'm not saying that we have. I'm just saying this year we're going to make some changes and some sacrifices as a church. We're going to do some things, a little bit different sacrifices as a church so that we can take a step closer to him. And One of those things, and we've never done this in the 13 years I've been here, one of those things, and you don't have to, but we're just going to do it as whoever wants to participate as a sacrifice of praise, is we're going to do a church-wide fast and prayer. And we're going to do three days of fasting and prayer, and then we're going to do a worship night celebration. So I want you to mark in your calendars January 29, 30, and 31. Three days. Fast and pray for the new year to fast and pray saying we're just going to do this because a sacrifice of praise it's just, it's, just, it's just the reason we're doing it it's not because we're trying to get something from God we're just doing it to do one sacrifice one step closer to draw near to God so that in this year we can see hey God draw near to us Amen. and then January 31st it's a Wednesday night we're going to open up this room and we're just going to worship no set agendas, no, no we're just going to worship. And then we'll break the fast with the big feast together and celebration and all the rest. So mark your calendars, January 29, 30, and 31. Another thing that we're going to do this month is in uh, not uh, following next Sunday, the 14th, that week in there, 
we're going to open up and we're going to start a Bible study called Rooted. And it's a 10-week Bible study um, that is fantastic. And what it does is it really, I've gone through it myself, and it's absolutely amazing at what it does in re revealing God on a whole nother level, but it also connects you with the people that you're taking the, the, the course with. As one way, and just saying, hey, you're going, I don't know if I can afford the time. No, listen, I want you to hear me. There's some things. And I know not everyone's going to do it. And I know that you don't have to feel pressured to do it. Just, just you pray and all the rest. But we're going to provide opportunities and say, we're going a little bit deeper. And we want to we provide some of these things and saying, hey, it's a step, one step closer. Drawing near to God. Our sacrifice. Grace. Amen. Lord, we thank you for who you are. That you're merciful and gracious and kind and loving. And Lord, forgive me for misplacing sacrifice, some of my sac things that I sacrifice for. I thank you for the wisdom to know what to do and the courage to be able to follow through. Lord, we want to draw closer to you.